Hello, and thank you so much for joining us today. We are on our second session and speaking about Jewish magic, sorcery, amulets, and bowls. So today we're really going to focus on the question of demons. And this might seem like a topic far from most of you that are watching. I mean, we, most of you, I, I think, I assume, don't really necessarily believe in demons. Maybe you have never seen a demon. But I think that in the era that is post-COVID, this is something that may, or not exactly post-COVID, but sort of post-COVID, I think it is something that a lot of people could understand a bit more. So you might relate to this, that when we were in the, uh, the height, heightened time of the COVID era, um, the experience of walking around and just being hyper vigilant to your surroundings, you know, someone sneezing or coughing and you're looking in that direction thinking, did I get COVID? Did I, didn't I get COVID? Or just being on the public transportation on an airplane or on a bus and looking around and being very aware of your surroundings and having this feeling that there is something that may at any moment, uh, I don't know if attack you, but at least um, affect you in a certain way. So thinking about this may help us understand a bit more the reality um, of having a world that is in a way filled with demons, or at least that is the way that people experienced it. And in the period that we are focusing on, the period of rabbinic literature, uh, late antiquity, demons are something that, uh, an, a belief that is very widespread. So for example, um, you could see it in a very, uh, in a very um, common way in the New Testament, in the Gospels, with Jesus, so the stories of Jesus exercising demons from various people. And we understand that it's a, it is a widespread belief. And Jews, too, were indifferent uh, in their belief of demons that are surrounding them. And we're going to see different ways in which they deal with this. Also, the rabbis and what they tell us in rabbinic literature, and also archaeological findings of metal amulets and ceramic bowls. So I want to begin with a story from the Babylonian Talmud that reads uh, as follows. Abba Binyamin said, if the eye had permission to see, no creature would be able to withstand the demons. Similarly, Abaye said, they are more numerous than we are, and they stand over us like mounds of earth surrounding a pit. So Abba Binyamin says that if someone could actually see what is happening around him, he wouldn't be able to withstand it because he would realize just how 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 many demons are around them. I mean, it's sort of like an experience of being on a Zoom with hundreds of people looking at you, but you can't actually see them. And not that I'm, of course, comparing the viewers to demons, but really that feeling that they're invisible and everywhere around you. And they're more numerous than people, and they're standing up over us like mounds of earth surrounding a pit. So imagine being inside a pit and looking uh, above you and seeing just um, thousands of demons. Rav Huna said, each and every one of us has 10,000 demons on his right and a thousand on his left. Uh, as it is written, a thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand. The crowding at the months of the Kala are from them. Those knees that are fatigued are from them. Those clothes of the sages that wear out is from friction with them. So the rabbis uh, speak about the months of the kala, the two months a year where many Jews went to the study house to study with the rabbis. And it was the, the sense of the crowdedness and also the, the friction and the fatigue and the clothes that are wearing out. They explain all of this as a uh, uh, result of the meeting, meeting with demons. So when we look at this passage from Tractate Brachot, we understand just how widespread the, this belief is in demons and how deep it is in the feeling and just the, the experience of a person who is walking in a world filled with demons. Uh, just, I, I won't be able to get in, into detail of of course, of all rabbinic passages that deal with demons, and I really had to choose just a few 
Um, and there are, especially in the Babylonian Talmud, a lot of different uh, passages that have to do with demons. Uh, we won't really go into the, where they come from, maybe, maybe in the Q&A, but I do want to speak a little bit about the, correct, correct, sorry, the characteristics of them. So we have in Tractate Chagiga, six things are said regarding demons, three, in three things they are like angels, and regarding three they are like human beings. Three like human beings, they eat and drink like human beings, they pro procreate like human beings, and they die like human beings. So we have this list of different characteristics of the demons in which they are like humans and in which they are like angels. So I, I didn't bring the whole passage, they're like angels, for example, in their ability to fly. Um, and they are like humans in that they eat and procreate, and most importantly for us, they die like human beings, which assists people if they want to get rid of them. But this is really how uh, the rabbis envision the demons, and not only the rabbis, as these uh, hybrid creatures that have also something in common with humans. So now I want to go and uh, now I want to speak a little bit about, and this will be the focus of our meeting today, I want to speak about the archaeological findings which can also uh, demonstrate how, how demons were envisioned, how they were imagined in terms of how, what they looked like, and also what are the ways to combat these demons. Now demons, um, of course, they, they can cause a lot of horrible things. Uh, and mostly different kinds of diseases, um, different kinds of seizures. Uh, we know from later on, you know, liter the literary, also in literary works, the, the Dibuk. And actually, till this day, you could go later on YouTube and find uh, modern day exorcisms and people that are uh, feeling that they are indeed uh, seized by a demon and some sort of either rabbi or miracle worker comes and um, exercises the demon from them. So in this image from an incantation bowl that soon we'll speak more about, about it, you could see two demons that are chained to each other in the neck and in the legs. You may notice that their legs are sort of like uh, chicken feet. And this also has to do with something we also find in the Babylonian Talmud. I didn't bring this source, that if one, this is also from Tractate Brachot, if someone wants to know if there is a demon uh, in his or her house, if there's a demon haunting them, you could put dirt next to your uh, bed, and in the morning when you wake up, if you see chicken feet, then indeed there are demons in your house. Of course, you could all try this at home. And we have a story of Ashmedai, the demon, and the, the story with him and uh, Shlomo, King uh, uh, Solomon. And also there we find um, uh, the, this belief that they have sort of chicken feet, and this is something that comes up in the bowls as well. There's an excellent book by Nama Vilozhny who uh, looks at the um, images on these bowls and really defines the different characteristics. So... Before we get to the bowls, I want to take us uh, back here to the land of Israel and to an archaeological finding also from late antiquity, from the time uh, of, uh, of the Talmud and uh, various rabbinic literature. So we have uh, a corpus of about 100 metal amulets, some that derive from archaeological uh, excavations and some from uh, the antiquity market, and these are amulets that were inscribed in Jewish uh, Aramaic, in Hebrew letters, sometimes in, in Greek as well, and they, the purpose of them was that maybe you could see this on the image in front of you, that uh, except for the engraving of the tiny letters, there are lines, and this metal amulet was actually folded and then worn in a sort of case on the neck. And we have, as I mentioned, about 100 of these, uh, mostly published by uh, Shaul Shaked and Yosef Neve, and a, in a recent doctoral dissertation by Rivka Elitzur Laiman, we have uh, additional readings of these uh, metal amulets. So the am amulets were worn by men and women, and they were intended to combat 
demons and disease. Sometimes for women, they were for childbirth. And this is a very unique finding because when we look at this period and we want to learn about Jews in the ancient world, we have mostly the literary uh, material from the rabbinic perspective. And here we have these objects that people, men and women, wore on them. And it gives us a sense of, um, you know, the daily lives. What were they scared of? What did they desire? What were the beliefs? So it gives us another, um, another uh, vantage point to view this uh, ancient society at the time of rabbinic literature, but from a different perspective. So I wanted to just give an example for the content of some of these amulets. So this, for example, uh, is from an amulet. The, 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 the text is from an amulet from the book uh, by Navet and Shaked, Amulets and Magic Bowls. And it reads like this. An amulet to heal Yaita, the daughter of Marianne, from the fever and the shiver and the evil eye. And now there's a list of uh, divine names. Abraxas, Ya, Yahu, El, 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 Exorcise the fever and the shiver, the female demons and the spirits from the body of Yaita, the daughter of Marianne. In the name of I am who I am, Eya Shereye, Amen, Amen, Sera. So we have this text and I just brought some of it. And this is uh, pretty standard. You have a list of the different um, demons or diseases that are haunting the specific client who commissioned it. And then the list of the holy names, the list of the adjurations of the of the holy names with with which the healing is supposed to occur and so this is you see here demons alongside spirits and fevers and shivers a lot of times and we'll see this also next week when we talk about talmudic magical healings a lot of times we find demons and um, and sickness together alongside each other. Even sometimes a name of a demon will be a name of a sickness, and this has to do with what I began this, uh, this session with. It has to do with the notion that demons bring certain diseases. Certain demons can cause uh, a disease. Last week I spoke, for example, about epilepsy, that when someone has an epileptic attack, and we see this also in the Gospels, um, this is something that is seen as a demonic attack, that a, a demon went inside the person and caused him or her to act this way. So that is the, those are the amulets. And later on, we're going to speak about who are the kinds of people who engraved these different objects, because we spoke a little bit last week about the problematic uh, the problematic title magicians or sorcerers, which a lot of times have to do with our notions of what is magic and what is sorcery, but not necessarily the notion in late antiquity. So we're going to talk about that a little more, but now I want to move on, move to a different geographic location, and that is Babylonia, uh, modern day Iraq, um, and from the Sasanian Empire. And this is a very crucial time in Jewish history because the, the time of that we're speaking about, the Sasanian Empire, because this is the time where the Babylonian Talmud was redacted and uh, composed and redacted. And it, it was a period that shaped uh, Judaism as we know it um, for, and for generations to come. So our, actually our only archaeological finding or our only meaningful textual finding from the, the Jewish uh, textual finding from the time of the Talmud is these bowls. So here you see an example from a bowl from the Israel Museum collection. You can see that we have Hebrew letters and uh, in Jewish Babylonian Aramaic in a sort of spiral form. And this is one of... Uh, something like 2,000 bowls that we know of today that were intended to, um, to protect households from curses and uh, uh, malice and, of course, from all sorts of demons. Uh, and we have a very large list of de detailed demonology 
with demons with various different names. Some of you may know some of them, like Lilith and Ashmedai, Agrat Bat Machlat, other demons that also um, continue to be central in uh, Jewish magic and mysticism throughout the ages. So some of these bowls are also uh, for other purposes, such as cursing or uh, um, gaining favor in the, in, in the eyes of named individual. For business, business success, there's even one bowl that was intended for um, making wine uh, uh, better. So we have all different kinds, but mostly it's for protection against demons and sickness. So what happened was a scribe wrote, uh, in, soon, soon we'll look at each of these, but a scribe wrote uh, incantation, divine names, in ink on a surface of an earthenware bowl, and later the bowl was buried, uh, usually in the house of the named client who commissioned it. So I mentioned that we have about, we know of, of about 2,000 bowls. Um, only about 600 have been published up to date, and when I, mean, when I say published, I mean that um, so a, a scholar um, deciphered the text and published it Many of these bowls still remain unpublished and, we're, and, and it's still a new field in terms of uh, learning what exactly we have in these various bowls and what we could learn about Jewish society. So I'm going to zoom in and look at some of these different bowls and their images. And you could see that there is really a difference in the, the I, would, I would call it the expertise of the scribe who was making them. You could see, for example, uh, here in this bowl, these small uh, Hebrew letters written in a very uh, professional manner. And next to it, you have this demon, which I'm sure all of you at home are very uh, scared right now about the, this uh, very fearful demon. And here you could see that the the, the um, handwriting is a bit crude. Uh, it's not entirely clear uh, what this text actually says. And again, you could see different, different uh, kinds of uh, also of handwriting and also some that have images, some that don't have images. And I will also say that there's a very big difference in the content and we will be able to see some of this. For, ex for example, this is a bowl that we'll see also next week is a Jewish bowl that invokes the name of Jesus. And this bowl that we will so soon see and zoom in actually has learned Jewish content. Okay, it has, a, for example, a quote from the Mishnah, the rabbinic compilation from the second century. And there's a very, the, the, the text and the content of the various bowls are very different. And it is important for us not to look at all of these bowls as, some, as a product of you know, one uh, uh, um, school of magicians that, uh, uh, that had these popular notions of religion and syncretistic notions, but rather uh, varied and a very different um, corpus of texts that were written by various scribes, some of which had knowledge and training from a more uh, Jewish from what we would see something more rabbinic and others that have uh, different content coming from maybe religious groups that we don't necessarily know about like Jewish Christians, etc. Um, so moving on, this is the bowl I mentioned, a, a bowl published by uh, Dan Levine that contains a uh, uh, various invocations for demons who appear in all different forms. So the article that Dan Levine published is called If You Appear as a Pig, because one of the, one of the different formulae that we find on, on the bowl is for a demon who appears as a pig, but also as different animals and demons can appear also as people. And we find in the invocations various angelic names, so, some that are known also from the uh, late antique Jewish uh, mystical um, uh, composition known as Heichalot literature. We have a quote from the Mishnah, which is very interesting. We have different biblical verses, and it is clear that the person who is writing this, and you could also see that it's very uh, beautiful handwriting, it is clear that he has knowledge that would fit someone who 
um, I don't know if he's necessarily a rabbi, but he is proficient in some of the rabbinic traditions. Um, so moving on to, oh, something that I wanted to say also is something that's very important to mention is that the bulls mostly derive, there are some bulls that already in the beginning of the 20th century were found in archaeological excavations in Nippur, uh, uh, modern day uh, southern central Iraq, but a lot of this material uh, comes from the uh, antiquity market, meaning their provenance is unknown. Uh, they're mainly stemming from two collections, a large collection um, called the, the Schoyen collection, and another one from uh, the Musayev collection, which is now in the National Library of Israel. And many of the bowls in this presentation are from that collection. So I'm um, returning to the question of the scribes, because last week we problematized the words magicians and sorcerers, and again, that it a lot of times has to do with our preconceived notions of what is magic and what is sorcery and not with the actual text. So let's look a bit at the, at the text of the bulls, at what we find there, and try to think who are the people who could have been writing these different bulls. So you saw this image before of uh, the bowl, again, from the Musayev collection. You see here uh, someone, <laughs> probably a demoness that is not wearing clothes and she has chicken legs again as we have mentioned before and she's chained by her legs up into up until her neck her hands are also chained on the top and this has to do with uh, the notion that she is bound and chained something that we also find a lot of times in the texts of the bulls that want to bind and chain the demon uh, in order that he won't, uh, or he or she won't be able to escape. Now that is just one of the methods of combating a demon. Another one, which is unique to this finding of the Aramaic incantation bowls, is using a divorce document. So uh, um, many of you know of the divorce documents uh, that in Jewish uh, in Jewish halacha, the get that a man uh, gives, his, um, gives his wife, soon to be ex-wife, in order that she will be divorced from him and she can marry someone else. And the divorce document has a long uh, history in Jewish uh, halakha, in Jewish tradition, also in findings, archaeological findings of documents. And what we see uh, very interestingly is that the bulls employ this legal formula in order to divorce not the the man and the wife of the house but to divorce the man from the man or the woman residing in the house to divorce the demons that are haunting them so we're going to read together an example i am casting and drawing a lot and making a magical act and it was in the dwelling of rabbi yoshua bar parachia i am writing them a get a divorce document to all the male and female Liliths who appear to this Uri daughter of Maroshita and to this Kakai son of Tsiporta in the dream of, of the night and the sleep of the day. So we get this uh, first person formula in which the, the scribe or the practitioner is saying that he's writing a divorce document to the male and female Liliths who appear to this couple, this client by the names of uh, Uri, that's the woman's name, and Kakai. And <clears throat> the, the, it's important to note here, I, I mentioned that in Jewish halakha, the divorce is strictly from a man to a woman, but here the divorce document is actually from a couple to uh, uh, another couple or to various male and female livists. And this is the uh, continuation of this, uh, of this bowl text. And you may not appear to them, not in the dream of the night and not in the sleep of the day. For I have released you from them by a d document of divorce and a get of discharge uh, dis or dismissal and a letter of separation. Get piturin ve'igeret shibukin. According to the law of the daughters of Israel, of Israel 
uh, meaning Kedat Bnat Israel. You may know the uh, formula Kedat Mosheve Israel, uh, according to the law of Moses in Israel. Soon we will uh, speak about this. From this day and forever, Amen, Amen, Sela, Hallelujah, for thy name's sake I have done. Gabriel, Gabriel and Michael and Raphael, and those sealed and, or signed upon this get, this divorce document. So we have here a, no, a number of elements that we recognize from the human divorce. One is using the terms get tiruchin ve'igeret shibukin that we know already from the Mishnah. From, and another thing is according to the law of daughters of Israel, in some, of ver in some bowls we also have according to the law of Moses and Israel, and, and this is something that also in this period in uh, late antiquity, um, when we have Jewish documents, we actually have a second century uh, divorce document from Mitzada. Also there, there's a different, um, there's a different term. There's Kedat Moshe Yehudain. So we have a few terms about this according to the law, something that we know today of according to Moses in Israel. In any case, we have a number of elements that we recognize from the divorce. So what I mentioned, we also have the perpetuity clause from this day and forever, minyoma denan ve'le'alam. We have the uh, signatures of the witnesses, something that is very important in the divorce document. But here the witnesses are, of course, the angels. So we have this divorce document, and I want to emphasize that the scribe doesn't just say this is a divorce, but rather he uses specific terminology. And this is especially interesting from a sentence we find in another bowl or in, in a series of other bowls that we have some sort of a, what, what I would call a permission clause, uh, a sentence that we know from rabbinic literature and from Jewish documents that a human divorce in order, a human Jewish divorce, in order for it to be valid, needs to have a permission clause in which the woman is allowed to go and uh, marry someone else. Without this permission clause, the divorce document is not valid. So also bulls have this exact sentence. They have it, but instead of having a human female addressee, they have a demonic and addressee. So this bull reads, in order that if you may have authority and power over yourself, yeah, we're talking about the demon, to any man that you wish, for I have written to you a deed of divorce and a document of release. So similarly to what we find in rabbinic literature and what we find in archaeological do documents, for example, I mentioned the document from Mitzada, the, the divorce document. So we have a very similar very similar sentences in which the, the, the uh, person who divorces, either a woman or in another case, a male demon or a female demon, uses and employs this same permission clause. So this is part of a much larger phenomena of, of the Jewish, Babylonian, uh, Aramaic incantation bowls in which the scribes used legal formulae. They used language that we know from legal documents. And this could be in time designations, meaning some of these bowls, for example, have a specific date um, according to the Seleucid era from the um, 5th and 6th century, uh, 6th and 7th century. And we have uh, um, uh, self-designations, mean, meaning the bowl will start with something like, this is a divorce document, the bowl will uh, refer to itself as a divorce document. We have different Jewish legal formula and Jewish divorce formula, as we have already seen, perpetuity clauses and closing formulae. Now, looking at all of these, looking at these different um, uh, formulae that have to do with the realm of legal documents makes us ponder why. Why do we have a magical amulet? We, we saw before the metal amulets, they don't have divorce. Why in the case of the bulls we find uh, legal formulae? So this has to do with um, a proposal about the identity of the people who actually wrote the bulls. So uh, Siam, the, uh, a scholar by the name of Siam Bairo and Dan Levine and myself, we each argued 
that the people who are writing these various uh, incantation bowls were in fact scribes. They're, you know, not magicians or sorcerers, rather they were employed as scribes and the knowledge of their legal language comes from their profession. The reason that they're using this very specific uh, uh, legal jargon is because this is something that they, they know how to do from their uh, guild, from their social and uh, professional context. And this has to do with other content we find on the bowls. So we find many biblical passages with the uh, sometimes just the, the uh, Hebrew, sometimes with the translation to Aramaic, the Aramaic uh, Targum. We find liturgy, various uh, attestations of liturgy, and this, is, this also, con, also con, uh, con, concerning the biblical passages, also concerning liturgy, and of course also the Mishnah. All of this is important to note that we're talking about findings from the 5th to 7th century, and this is a time where we don't have this, um, we don't have this various uh, findings of prayer books, etc. So this could really help in reconstructing practices from various different uh, domains, such as the study of Jewish prayer, because we actually have uh, findings, material findings from the time of the Talmud. So here, for example, is a bowl with the Shema prayer. And the reason that I'm saying that it's a prayer and not just biblical pa passages has to do with the fact that it has not only the verse Shema Yisrael, but also the Baruch Shem Kevod Merchuto Leolam Va'ed, yeah, blessed be the name, etc., which derives from the liturgy and not from the biblical passages. I mentioned that we have a quote from the, we have a few quotes from the Mishnah, and this is also the earliest attestation of the Mishnah uh, outside of, you know, the later manuscripts. And this may also be connected to the liturgical world because two of the quotes that we have are from a Mishnah. I won't go into this, but you could see here the, the reference to an article by Shaul Shaked, who uh, um, suggests that actually the Mishnah is deriving from the liturgy, um, something that we find till this day that in the, the prayer, uh, the morning prayer in Shacharit, there is um, the, this Mishnah from Zvachim, Elohim Mekumam Shel Zvachim. In any case, this is just to say that the people, some of the people, some of the scribes who are writing have this knowledge of a learned Jewish content. Now, this is something I want to emphasize is very different from what we saw at, regarding the metal amulets. So I mentioned that in metal amulets, we do not have the divorce formula. We have uh, uh, various uses of biblical passages and holy names, angel names, etc. Many things that I have mentioned, but it is different. And usually when scholars uh, uh, speak about the, these materials from the period of late antiquity, these Jewish materials, they will say these are magical materials. This is, uh, uh, you know, a product of magicians. But actually, we have to be very careful in putting all of these together because what you see here are two very different objects. It is true that both there is a similarity between them because they both aim at the same thing, removing demons, removing disease. But if you'll notice, they are different in terms of the, the craft that is required to produce them. So if someone, and you guys could of course try this at home, go to you know your nearest cabinet, take out a bowl, it's usually about a, like a soup bowl, and write, start writing in, uh, 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 you know, like this in, in these tiny letters, in straight lines, various things that you would like to write. It's a very difficult task, and it makes sense that someone who does this is really proficient in the art of writing. And this would be uh, um, the person who would be most combat compatible with this uh, type of technical uh, expertise are scribes. 
And on the other hand, when you look at the metal amulet, it is something very different. Taking a metal sheet, and of course this is also a very difficult task, but just in terms of the set of tools, also physically, literally, and also, you know, just in, in terms of your expertise and knowledge, it is something very different to engrave in metal sheet these metal sheets, these tiny letters. So if I'm connecting this to what we saw last week, we have to be careful in our use of the term magicians because it blinds us to understanding the social and professional context of these various objects. So when we try to think about how the rabbis and how rabbinic mainstream traditions viewed these various objects, we have to look at it also from the content of the objects themselves and also from what rabbinic literature tells us. Okay, so we shouldn't necessarily make the connection and say, okay, we have in Jewish halakha, in, in, the, in the Jewish Hebrew Bible, as we saw last week, a prohibition to engage in sorcery. So this is probably something prohibited. Rather, we should try to think, wait, but what is sorcery according to the Hebrew Bible? And is this something that is considered sorcery or is this a legitimate healing practice? And for this, we could, we could look at rabbinic literature itself and what it has to say about amulets. So there's a very interesting story from Tractate Psachim in the Babylonian Talmud that addresses this, uh, uh, the need for writing amulets. And notice who are the people who are described writing these various amulets. So I'm reading. Reeds that are near the city have no less than 60 demons. So there are this uh, uh, tree, this sort of reeds, and, and this is in the context of, of uh, in the Babylon, Babylonian Talmud that tells us of various trees that have demonic uh, dangers. So a certain town official went and relieved himself among the reeds and was endangered. So someone went to those reeds, he didn't know that there were 60 demons there, and of, of course that made it very dangerous. A certain sage, yeah, a rabbinic sage, came and wrote for him an amulet against one demon. He did not know that the reeds held 60 demons. So a rabbinic sage came and wrote an uh, amulet for one demon because he didn't, you know, he didn't read the, the tractate Psachim, so he didn't know that actually the reeds had 60 demons. And of course, because he didn't write the, the right amulet, it didn't work and he heard the demons rejoicing and singing in the reeds. Master's scarf is like that of a sage, but we have examined him and he does not know how to bless. So the demons are in the, the reeds singing and mocking the rabbinic scholar for looking like a, a, a sage, looking like a scholar having the right you know, uh, outfit for that. But when the demons examined him, he didn't know how to bless, meaning he didn't know how, it's a, a euphemism for curse. He didn't know what to do with them because he didn't um, learn that the reeds actually have 60 demons. And then a certain scholar came who knew that the reeds held 60 demons and he wrote an amulet for 60 demons. He heard them, the demons, say, remove yourselves from here. So there's a happy ending comes another scholar who does know that the reeds held 60 demons and he writes the correct amulets and indeed the demons leave. Now this uh, rabbinic story is telling uh, for, in a number of ways. First of all, as I have emphasized before, the person that is writing the amulet is not described not as a magician, not as a sorcerer, not as some sort of folk he healer, but as a sage as a, 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 a rabbi, a humi rabbanan. And these are the people that are expected to write the correct, um, the correct uh, amulet. Moreover, there's something here that we saw also in the bowls, something that has to do with the need for precision. It wasn't enough to write some sort of general amulet. There was a need to know what this tree is, what is the dangers inside, and then to write the cor correct uh, prescription. Now, when we, I, I spoke a little bit about the legal language in the bowl, in the bowls, and this is very, this has to do with this uh, very much because 
in a legal document, yeah, you, when you want to buy or, or sell a house, for example, you have to note where the house is, what floor, how many meters, etc. And uh, it, it, there's a need to be very precise. And when you aren't, this is something that could be problematic. So in the same way, also, when one writes an amulet for a demon, just as we have seen in the incantation bowls, and as we see here in the Talmud, there is a need to be very precise. And I want, before we move to the Q&A, I want to read another story from the Babylonian Talmud that also very much connects to the sort of worlds we find uh, in, the, in the metal amulets and especially in, in the incantation bowls. It, in, in one way, it also uh, details the experience of walking in a world that is full of demons, but also what are the means of a person to deal with, the, with this demonic uh, danger and demonic harms. So I'm reading from Tractate Chulin. Abaye said, at first I would say that the reason that people do not sit under a gutter is because of the wastewater that pours from it. But the master said to me that it is because demons are commonly found there. Okay, so Abaye thought at the beginning that the reason that, um, that gutters, someone shouldn't be under a gutter is because of the wastewaters from the gutters, but then he found out that it was actually because of demonic presence. And I will say here, I will note that the bowls also reference the demons, certain demons who sit in the gutters, so this is really a dangerous place. And now we hear about a story. There were certain porters who were carrying a barrel of wine. When they wanted to rest, they placed the barrel under a gutter and the barrel burst. They came before Mar Barav Ashi, who took out a shofar and excommunicated the demon. So there are people who are carrying these barrels of wine and they wanted to sit and rest, so they put it under the gutter and then the barrel burst. Now, when we think about the experience of having or believing in demons, so when you hear a loud noise and you think that you're surrounded by demons, it, it um, makes sense that the person or the, the entities that are responsible for, the, for this loud noise is a demon. So they, uh, they went to Mar Barav Ashi, who took a shofar and excommunicated the demon, and these are elements we also find in the moles. So now, uh, what happens with, what, what will Mar Barav, Mar Barav Ashi do? This is the second part of the story. The demon came before Mar Barav Ashi and said to him, Why did you do this? Why did you excommunicate me? Uh, sorry, why did you, why did you, sorry, the Mar Barav Ashi asked the demon, Why did you do this? Why did you explode, make the, the barrel of wine explode? The demon answered, how else should I have acted when they placed it in my area of dwelling? So they came and put their uh, wine in my area of dwelling. Of course, the natural thing would be to, um, to cause such damage. And Mar Baravashi responds to the demon, even so, in an area where there are many, when there are many people, you do not have permission to dwell. You are the one who deviated, go and pay. The demon responded, set a time for me so that I will pay off the debt. The rabbi set a time, and the demon did not come in this time. When the demon eventually came, Mar Barav Ashi said, why did you not come at the time set for you? Why were you late? The demon answered, with regard to any item that is tied up or sealed or measured or counted, we have no permission to take it until we find an ownerless item. Uh, something that is uh, hefker. So the demon is late in paying back the, the damages for the wine. And the, the rabbi said, why are you late? And he said, it's because I can't just go around and collect money. I have to take something that is an ownerless item. So this story is very interesting in many ways. First of all, in terms of, the, in terms of understanding this experience of, the, of, of Jews who lived at the time of the Talmud, it, as I mentioned, it really exposes the, the, how they, they experience space, how they experience the different places. You know, we have in, in the Talmud other places that are considered dangerous, such as uh, the, the bathroom or places that are desolated. And here we have the gutters. So in one, in one uh, that's one aspect. Another thing has to do with even though they, they lived in such a scary world where demons can attack at any minute, it's not just, you know, the, there are rules. The, the demons also, 
they have to respond to 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 the legal system to the law and this is because this we could see that the rabbi excommunicates him by using the shofar and that he has to pay back now some of you might be seeing this story and saying okay you know this story it's not so um, realistic and and it has uh, a moral to it and i agree that there are many things that could be learned for example count your money and put it in your wallet and don't just leave it around or you know don't go and sit under gutters but when we look at this story and take the archaeological findings from that time and we see that they're using the same, they have the same beliefs also in terms of the places in which demons dwell and also in terms of how to, um, how to expel them using excommunications, using divorce and, um, and the very notion that the demons respond to law and to legal, uh, to legal institutions, it's not enough to just say that it's, you know, some sort of folklore, but really we have to try to understand the, these stories in the historical and cultural context in which they were written. And that context is a world in which um, the belief in demons was widespread and the ways to combat these different uh, uh, demons and the ways to deal with them is using what humans know how to use, and that is different, um, different spells and different biblical verses, and also legal institutions that we see that they work in, uh, in the human context, and we expect them to work in the demonic context as well. So if I conclude today's uh, session, so we, we were looking at the different, the different um, uh, uh, um, ways to deal with the fact that demons are, uh, are omnipresent in the uh, social reality of late antiquity. So we saw that this is something that comes up in rabbinic literature and in archaeological findings, and that we should be careful in t speaking about this as magic and sorcery, something that may distance it from our uh, you know, modern scientific experience, but try to understand it in the historical context in which this is even a sort of a science of how uh, humans uh, experience their reality. And another thing that, we, um, that I tried to emphasize today is how these different texts that we find, these different archaeological findings and the specific passages from rabbinic literature that have to do with, um, with demons and with magic, how they, could, um, how they could show us a whole another part of history that we're sometimes not used to delving into. And this is the social history, the history of, of uh, daily life, of men and women, voices that we don't always hear. These items can really expose this world and make us learn about people that are not necessarily the rabbinic elite or the literary elite that kept writing, but also ordinary people and their daily experiences. So thank you, and if there were questions, I'd be happy to answer some, or try. Thank you very much, Abigail. And there are plenty of questions, so we'll try and answer as many as possible. So Jonathan is at, says that the last demon you're talking about, he, he's a clearly law-abiding. And how does that mesh with demons being considered troublemakers? So, yeah, demons are troublemakers, but they are also law-abiding. And we saw this also in the, the amulets and bowls. So they try, you know, they, when, when with, there were the 60 demons and they didn't write the, the, the right amulet. So they're dancing and, and rejoicing in the tree. But, but at the end, they have to, they do abide to law. This is a law that also is something that affects them. So this is something we find also in rabbinic literature and also in the amulets and bowls that the demons, they have to adhere to law and legal institutions if they're pronounced correctly. So we have to pronounce them correctly. Okay, so we have a few questions about the bowls themselves. Were they used to drink a potion from or just held by hand? What was actually done with them? So unfortunately, we don't know exactly. We, we assume that there was some sort of 
uh, ritual, but what we found, what the archaeologists found in the beginning of the 10, 20th century is bowls that were, were buried usually upside down. Uh, scholars think that maybe it was sort of a demon trap. They were uh, buried usually in the home. They weren't used, there, there weren't liquids used on that because that would be something that um, we could probably uh, uh, tell. Sometimes there are um, some natural substances that were found with the bowls, such as eggshells, which is something that we find in uh, magic, um, in magic spells, uh, in Jewish magic and non-Jewish magic. But uh, we mostly don't know exactly what was the ritual that, uh, uh, that there was with burying these bowls. Were these bowls unique to Jewish um, uh, traditions or were they used by other cultures around them? Okay, that's an excellent question. Um, so from these 2,000 or something bowls, about two-thirds are Jewish. We have another uh, third or something like that that was written in Syriac uh, script. That was the, the, the dialect of uh, the Syriac uh, dialect of Aramaic. So that, that's uh, uh, spoken by Christians. Uh, although we don't know if it was Christians and not Jews who made them, and also uh, uh, Mandaic bowls, which is another, Mandeans, another religious group. Later on, th and this is about, this is incantation bowls, but later on we have, for example, metal bowls uh, from Islamic uh, 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 culture, and we have different kinds, but, um, so this wasn't only Jews, but specifically what we saw today, these ceramic bowls are mostly uh, coming from uh, Jews. All right. Um, so you have uh, right that he's read the many writers of these bowls were women, like Kumish Bat Machlafta. And how does that work with your theory that scribes were the one who, who wrote these bowls? Uh, it doesn't work with my theory that scribes were the ones who wrote these bowls. I don't think because of the, the various uh, uh, factors that I um, suggested today, I do not think that women, I mean, just as we find in later, you know, in medieval times, when we have guilds of scribes, sometimes there's few women. I don't think that it, it's impossible that women wrote bowls, but in the case of named females, sometimes we have, for example, Kumish Bat Machlafta and other women that are mentioned in the first person that say, I, Kumish Bat Machlafta, as part of a divorce, usually as part of a divorce formula, and then the bowl goes back to third person, meaning ands go away from kumish. So this is more of a technique using the first person. We find this for men and women and couples, and I think that I, I think that mostly male scribes were responsible for this. Next, we'll see something that has to do with female healing, but that is not something that has to do with writing rather use of uh, natural substances. Okay, so thank you for the hint about next week. And um, we'll take another question or two, there's plenty of them. So Robin wants to know if these bowls were found specifically in cities where major yeshivot were located, such as Suan Pupedita, and can we assume that these bowls were the same as the amulets mentioned in the Talmud? Uh, great questions. Um, so the bowls, unfortunately, as I mentioned, most are, are non-provenanced and they do not come from um, the, the major rabbinic centers that you mentioned. It could be that some of the non-provenance bowls did come from there, and this is something that has been suggested by scholars, especially the ones who have learned Jewish content, so uh, it's hard to say. Regarding, are these the same amulets that are mentioned in the Talmud? I think this is just one specimen of amulets that we have. This is just uh, a coincidence that these are the amulets that came to us because they were buried in the ground. But I, I really think that it's reasonable to assume that people had so many different kinds of amulets that they wore, that they put in their home. And so amulets mentioned in the Talmud can be these, but they can also be other different amulets. And some of these bowls also begin with the words, this is an amulet. So they are considered amulets, but there are also many different types. Okay, so I think one last question. Um, why did the bowls disappear from Jewish culture today? Great question, <laughs> as all of the questions today. Uh, it's hard to say. Um, they did disappear after the uh, Muslim conquest and um, I have I don't have a good answer. It's a it's a it's a better question than an answer. 
We don't have bowls, but we do have interesting continuities from the bowls to modern day culture. Let's, well, we, we won't go till uh, now, but for example, we have in the Cairo Geniza, um, the medieval finding in, uh, in Cairo of various manuscripts. So some of the uh, uh, Jewish magic found there uh, has a continuity mostly with the lands of Israel, but also from Babylonia. For example, Dan Levin and Gidon Bork um, uh, published a, a, a divorce document for a Lilith that was found in the Geniza that is very similar to what we found in the bowls. So although we don't have uh, uh, bowls, we do have the, the various formulae that continued throughout Jewish magical traditions. Okay, thank you very much, Abigail. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We'll be here again next week with our third session. And um, as ma many have asked, you should be getting an email uh, with the link also to this, um, to this lecture when, once it's uploaded to our website. So if you miss anything, you want to send it on to anyone else to enjoy, you're welcome to. Thank you, everyone, and good evening.